Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us on our UK SOX presentation. Um, we're delighted to have you here, and certainly here in Dublin, it's a blue sky, and in my attic, it's lovely and warm, so uh, spring is certainly here. Um, we decided we'd have this presentation um, towards the end of the month because I think over the last couple of weeks, we had expected uh, the white paper uh, that this, these changes are going to uh, be developed on to be out. However, I think what we've done is through our interactions with stakeholders in the UK, uh, we have a strong feeling and there's been, like all things at the moment, there's been good leaking in advance as to what's to come. So we thought it was still worthwhile to, to present to you in relation to the topic. Uh, and we believe that there is uh, no regrets activities that can be started by you and your organization and to certainly um, feed the thinking engine in relation to it. I think it's been fair to say this has been a long time coming with three major uh, reports done in the UK uh, and with the new business secretary starting in January in the UK, Kwasi Kwarteng, who put an emphasis on one of the activities that he really felt uh, needed to be pushed forward over the coming months. So as we say, this is for him uh, all about the strengthening of corporate governance and the audit regime. Uh, when the white paper comes, it's expect expected that it'll have a six week consultation period, which is quite long uh, for these for white papers. Uh, and today we're going to focus on the corporate government aspects of this and the internal aspects rather than uh, audit reform. So we're very much focused on what we're calling UK SOX. So I have a number of speakers with me joining me today, but just to give you kind of some personal oversights in relation to my views on this. Uh, it, the changes are, are, are significant, where directors will be held personally responsible for the accuracies of the company's financial statements, with fines and bans for directors for major failures. Uh, so this moves it from the board to the director in terms of responsibility uh, for the accuracy of the, the financial statements, the sign-off of internal controls, and of risk management. In terms of this, um, the, for directors, the directors will face fines, uh, for breach of duties uh, and in relation to assessment to uh, audit standards, which for the non-accountant or the non-knowledgeable, how that works and that interaction with those who uh, may have skills in this space is going to be interesting to watch and that dynamic unfold. The, the white paper is going to be interesting in, in terms of uh, UK competitiveness, um, because there is that view of too many, uh, too many costs foisted in on the UK cor corporates, at this point in time, uh, impacts competitiveness and post pandemic where UK corporates are trying to get a push on uh, it, they, not to overdo it. So I think what may have looked likely 18 months ago, certain of those reforms may be held back, delayed or deferred or actually scrapped altogether. In terms of the breadth of this, with so many Irish companies uh, listed in the UK uh, or have made significant entities in the UK, that we are expecting the scope to be quite um, impactful in relation to Ireland, and also the broadening of what a public interest entity is, bringing it from kind of mostly limited entities to include large private groups, charities, and universities, all to be defined uh, as we will see later on. So there is a higher cost of compliance. We saw that when SOX came in many years ago in the US, uh, and uh, how that um, those learnings are brought to bear. We hope to share some of those learnings as well with you today. Uh, so it is socks with a twist, uh, and we're not 100% sure what those full twists are. So we're happy to take any questions, and there is a question box on your screen if you'd like to type those in, type your questions in, uh, and I can ask those at the end of the session. So I am joined by Linda and Michael today. Linda is a director in our risk advisory practice. She's uh, worked with us. Uh, for a number of years before going into corporate and then coming back to us. Um, Linda has uh, 10 years experience of working in internal control projects and SOX uh, attestation. Uh, Linda previously has been uh, involved in large programs with that PLC with the responsibility for SOX compliance uh, of a large finance transformation project too. Michael's a director in our UK risk advisory practice and leads the SOX advisory business and futures the controls team in the UK. He's 15 years experience specializing in internal controls over financial reporting in SOX. Interestingly, Michael works with a number of large multinational global clients across a wide range of industries. 
and has had heavy involvement with Deloitte's stakeholder engagement in the UK around this UK SOX topic. So delighted to have both speakers with you today. So uh, again, thank you very much for your time. Do put your questions into the question box and I can pick those up at the end of the presentation. And with that, I'll hand you over to Linda. Okay, thank you, Colm. Um, so as Colm mentioned, my name is Linda Neal and um, I'm a director here in, in risk advisory in, in the Deloitte practice in, in Dublin. Um, and I'm here today just to talk to you about, I suppose, what's been happening so far in, in, the, in the case of the UK SOX regime and I suppose the relevance to, to, to Ireland. Um, <clears throat> so I just, I suppose, start by saying, by, um, you know, where, where we first heard about the UK SOX regime, so we first heard about it through the Kingman report. Um, so Sir John Kingman was tasked with an undertaking to, to review the um, Financial Reporting Council in the UK. And his report gave rise to 83 recommendations. Um, sorry, if you just want to move on to the next slide. Um, 83 recommendations, um, one of which was to establish a new independent regulator in the UK. Um, and that would be the Audit Reporting and Governance Authority, the ARGA, and also to set out recommendations in relation to um, the role of this new regulator in corporate failure. So we just want to move on to the next slide there, sorry. Thank you. Um, so Kingman uh, recommended that the UK government, um, while working with the FCA and ARGA, should consider the case for strengthening quality uh, regulation around a wider range of inv investor information and related to that he recommended the in introduction of a strengthened framework for internal controls in the UK and he actually looked to um, the US SOX regime for, for a lessons learned perspective. Sir Donald Bryden then was tasked with completing um, an independent review into the, the quality and effectiveness of audit in the UK and that was in response to the perceived widening of the audit expectations gap. So that would be the difference between um, what users expect from an audit versus the reality of what an audit is and what auditors' responsibilities are. Um, so his report gave rise to a further 65 recommendations, which covered a range of audit-related matters, including the recommendations that Kingman had um, identified in his report. Um, and Bryden supported the implementation of the UK SOX regime. And then through the, the UK government and um, through the, the Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Select Committee have also supported um, the introduction of a strengthened regulatory framework around internal controls. So if we move on then just to the next slide, um, just giving a little bit more flavour and colour into what um, Bryden recommended when he supported the U UK SOX regime. So he suggested the introduction of um, what he called a SOX light program, um, which would consist of a signed attestation by the CEO and the CFO to the board. And this attestation would be supported with an annual evaluation of the, the effectiveness of a company's internal controls over financial reporting. So that would be very similar to the SOX requirement under paragraph um, 302 in the US. And specifically, um, Bryden related it to the, to the subsection C and D. So um, a very close relationship there to that recommendation and, and the US SOX requirements. Um, I guess where Bryden's recommendation differed slightly to the US regime was that rather than mandating an annual attestation by the auditor, um, he did suggest that um, the attestation would only be subject to audit if a failure arose. So that audit requirement would come in for the following three years from the identification of a failure. And Bryden also um, introduced the, the idea of um, an audit and assurance policy, which would require um, annual approval by the shareholders at the annual general meeting. Um, and this, the idea behind this, would it, it would give confidence to shareholders over the audit and assurance processes that are in place across the organisation, including those around internal controls. And I think what was interesting was that um, he suggested that that would, that would extend beyond internal controls over financial reporting and would also include con, um, control, uh, other controls 
such as those around environmental, social and governance obligations or cyber controls. And, and those were specific examples he called out in his report. So if we move to the next slide then, um, I suppose there's a question over what the timeline is and where are we now uh, and where are we in terms of confirming what a UK SOX regime will look like. So what we've done on this slide is we, we've just outlined a sequence of events um, over, I suppose, key, key things around, uh, key communications around internal control requirements. So you can see there on the slide that um, the Kingman report was published in late 2018 and closely followed by the Bryden report in, in 2019. And I suppose following, uh, another thing I'd probably just point out is following Bryden's recommendation, there was an internal control positions paper issued by the Audit Committee Chair's Independent Forum in 2020. So we now are eagerly awaiting this, the consultation pa paper as, as Co Colm has highlighted earlier. So um, again, we have seen some, some indication of what's to come um, and Colm referenced the, the Financial Times article. So that, case, that was um, in early February and it indicated that the consultation paper was in fact imminent. So I suppose internally we've been expecting this consultation paper since December 2020. When it didn't come in December, we thought we would see it in January. Um, we were sure we'd see it in February with the Financial Times article, but I guess now it's going to be March. Um, so I, I guess the one advantage of the Financial Times article is it did give us a, um, a slightly clearer expectation of what's coming. Um, so they've set out um, an extensive paper with recommendations which will see the introduction of rules that the Financial Times quoted were being similar to US SOX. Um, as Colin mentioned, it will make directors rather than boards personally responsible for the accuracy of the financial statements through an attestation program over internal controls and risk management. And where, where directors are found to have breached their duties around this requirement, they'll face um, fines and temporary bans. And it's also set to um, give new, uh, new powers to the regulator to enforce those standards for FTSE 350 companies. And then I suppose building on from Bryden's recommendation, um, it did go, it did mention that the, the internal controls were likely to, to go beyond financial reporting and reference the example of environmental and social obligations as well. So we just move to the next slide then. Um, I suppose I wanted to, to maybe highlight why, why we're talking about this um, and, and why it's become important. So um, just moving to the next slide again, um, I think it's important to highlight um, that the concept of UK SOX isn't entirely new. So if you look at the current uh, UK corporate governance requirements, their paragraph 29 does set out companies' responsibilities around monitoring um, a program of risk management and internal control. Um, and, and a requirement to carry out at least, annual, at least annually a review of the, the effectiveness of those systems and to report on those. And that those systems include financial um, as well as operational, operational and compliance controls. So, um, you know, despite that requirement in the UK uh, Corporate Governance Code, um, we are seeing corporate failures um, and I guess the, the, there's um, an idea that that without the support of a regulatory framework that a UK SOX regime would have um, there's an idea that the, the compliance with that um, the, the requirements of the code of governance are, are notional rather than actual um, and we have seen that in in recent corporate failures such as Carillion, BHS BHS and um, Patisserie Valerie. So I suppose both, both Bryden and Kingman noted that a UK SOX regime um, would, with appropriate um, support um, in terms of guidance and oversight, would give better assurance and confidence to external stakeholders 
Um, and that would extend not only to shareholders, but also to employees, customers and vendors. And that, that, that a, a regime like a UK SOX regime would also set a standard for quality um, in terms of controls. And it would also give the markets transparency um, where, where the companies fail to reach that standard of, of control. And again, I suppose in, in both the Kingman and the Brighton reports, they had done um, some research around the support for um, for a SOX regime and, and Kingman had looked to senior audit committee chairs of, um, of uh, US listed companies and they had reported back that um, the, the US SOX regime was seen to have led to better financial reporting and fewer, um, fewer uh, significant accounting restatements and stronger reassurances for audit committee members around the robustness of internal controls. Um, and that indeed, since, the, since um, the SOX regime had been introduced, there was a reduction in the number of reissuance statements over that time. So from 460 in 2005 to only 29 in 2017. So we are seeing, um, I suppose, a benefits arising from, from a, a US SOX regime. And I think in addition to that, Kingman also cautioned that um, the pros and cons of any UK regime should, should be analysed and, and, and consulted, uh, consulted upon. And they should also give consideration to the proportionality of the different sizes of the companies that are in the UK. So I guess there is an, an acknowledgement there that despite the benefits of the UK SOX regime, there is a huge cost of compliance, um, both financially as an upfront investment, but also on an ongoing basis, uh, again, in terms of finances, but also time and resources that are, are dedicated to the maintenance of a SOX regime within a company. And that any, any, UK, uh, any UK regime would actually pay homage to that and have an appropriate lead in time to, to allow companies to um, attain compliance. So if we go on to the next slide then, just to highlight why we're speaking about it specifically in the Irish context. So as Colin mentioned, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of Irish based companies that are listed on the UK stock exchange and they will naturally fall in under the requirements of any um, UK SOX regime. But I think also if you look at the requirements under the, under the Irish Euronext, um, the, the listing rules actually require a complier explain approach to the UK corporate governance code. And I've actually uh, on the slide there just um, pulled out the wording from, from the listing rules um, 6185, which requires compliance with the with code um, with the UK code of governance and specifically reference references um, paragraph C23, which is the requirement to, um, in the 2016 code to maintain a system of internal control and perform an annual review of its, its effectiveness. So um, while the Euronex haven't uh, communicated any intention or disregard for a UK SOX regime, I think it's fair to say that the, the UK, uh, the current UK and Irish uh, requirements are very much aligned and they're also in the same spirit as the UK SOX regime. I'd also highlight that it's not a phenomenon that we're seeing in the UK alone. We've seen similar regimes being introduced across the globe. Um, there's, there's similar regimes currently in effect in, in Canada, Switzerland and Japan. And we're also seeing, re we've also seen recent introductions of, um, of regimes in the Netherlands, South Africa and Germany. So I think you know, as, com as company directors, you do have to challenge yourself on a few items. You know, um, you have to challenge whether or not you have adequate oversight um, around the internal controls over financial reporting. And if you don't, if you feel that you don't have adequate oversight, I think you have to ask yourself, do you want to be um, a driver behind the change or do you want to run the risk of being the reason for the change? So without, um, suppose, but without further ado, I'll just pass you on to Michael, who, who will be able to give you a better flavour of, of a UK 
of the expected UK soccer regime. Okay, thank you and good morning everybody. Um, as Colm said up front, I'm Michael Stallard, a, a director in Deloitte's UK risk advisory practice and I've been leading on our, our SOX efforts over the last few years and have also been involved with the team who's who's been formulating our various public policy responses to, to UK SOX and, and what I'll cover over the next few slides will be our most recent public policy response um, with regard to getting ready for UK SOX. Can we move on to the next slide, please? So what we set out on, what I set out on this slide are five items that uh, we believe are vital for a UK SOX regime to be successful. Now on here, there's a combination of internal and external items. Some of them seem fairly obvious, but do take into account some of the learnings we've had from the US regime over, over the last, well, the best part of two decades. Um, and what I'll do over the next, next few slides is, is talk through um, what each of these means to so unpack them a bit more, talk about why they're important, and then spend a little bit of time also going through some things that, that we think you should be thinking about with regard to each one of these. So can you move on, please? So first one is, is a risk-based approach. I guess it's, it's one of those that does seem fairly straightforward and, and, and fairly obvious, but it, it, I would like to reiterate that it is essential for any controls regime to have a strong risk assessment at its core that takes into account the business model, the principal risks and uncertainties, and, and also wider financial reporting risks and, and fraud risks. I suppose if I, in, in terms of why this is important, if I compare it to the initial response to US SOX going back to 2002, 2003, there was a bit of a blanket approach in terms of throwing controls at everything um, in, in the hope that corporates would end up compliant. And I think that there's, there's a lot of resource spent with, without a huge amount of benefit coming back. And I, I do think it's really important that that, that mistake is not repeated in the UK. Now, we had um, John Thompson in, in our, our academy just before Christmas. And John, I should say John Thompson is the, the chair of the FRC. Um, and he did say risk assessment is really important because it needs to be proportionate. And he, he called out a couple of examples. He, he said he would not expect AstraZeneca to be doing exactly the same thing as he would the smallest company that is main market listed in the UK. I think he said they have a market cap of about 12 million. So I do think it is, it is going to be really, really vital for that, that risk assessment to take into account the risks that exist within each business and, and the business model. For example, much easier for, for leadership to manage risks of a business that has a single site um, where they can oversee day-to-day -day operations versus an AstraZeneca with a much more complex and global business model. Um, so key things to be thinking about here, and again, th these are all quite easy to say, um, but I think important things to be to be challenging on a, at, at the board level. Um, so firstly, is, is the financial reporting risk register up to date? Um, how often does that get reviewed? Um, is, is the clear evidence that the board has reviewed the risk register and, and challenged? Um, and is it clear actually how those controls that, that are in place have been designed to mitigate those, those risks, um, taking into account the business model of, of the business? Um, I think one, one area where we don't typically see as much focus um, is does that risk assessment take into account IT? Um, I think in, in some cases general IT controls are, are covered around core systems but I don't think it necessarily takes into account all the different bits and types of IT that businesses are using and thinking about the way that many corporates are now digitising is that taking into account use of robotics, use of AI and thinking about an appropriate risk framework for those as they come in as well, um, rather than doing it in hindsight a couple of years later on. So, so some really important things to be to be challenging on 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 there. Um, can we move on, please? So, practical guidance. Um, what we mean by this is a really really clear framework that directors can use to base their controls program on. If I compare this again to, to what I see happening in the US at the moment, um, we have the SEC who regulates companies, we have the 
ECAOB, which is the enforcement arm of the SAC that regulates external auditors. Um, and what we actually see is, is a lot of the guidance, a lot of the regulation going by the back door, i.e. it goes via the FCC to the PCOB, to the auditor and then to the company, rather than being direct to the company. And I think it's it's vital moving into a UK controls regime to have clear guidance for the directors so actually they can execute the risk assessment we talked about on the previous page you know, in a way that is appropriate for their company and they can develop a really robust position without relying on or being dependent on external auditors telling them often quite late in the process what it is that is required and what the developments are and i do think that that will also enable companies to, to well, it will enable investors to have some confidence that in within the framework of a set of principles that companies are applying it consistently as well so in, in anticipation of of a uk regime being introduced just some things to be thinking about there so linda mentioned on the previous previous slides there are some requirements set out under the corporate governance code as it stands how, how do you fare against those at the moment um, and then taking that a step further um, if you were to then compare what you do against other internationally recognized control frameworks such as COSO perhaps being the most obvious one how would how would you stand up to that um, and then finally just are you consistent you know the approach that you have or you you would like to have is that consistent across all geographies um, can you evidence that compliance as well um, I think all of those things will, will, will be important can we move on please um, so having a strong regulator, um, I think having a strong regulator and, and probably having the right regulator as well is, is a better way of putting it. So at the moment we, we have the FRC um, in the UK, we are expecting that to be replaced by Arga. I think what, what we do need as well as having those that practical guidance and some really clear rules for directors to follow, taking the learnings from the US and making sure that there is right regulation direct to companies or some a way of, regu of regulating this direct to companies rather than relying on the external auditor and the PCAOB, which in, in my experience does does tend to happen. I think that'll give the directors a lot more confidence as well in that what they are doing is is correct and it will remove some reliance from the external auditor and really push more responsibility on onto the directors. Um, I think without that direct regulation, it's unlikely that this will really, really bed in, um, certainly bed in quickly. Um, okay, so in terms of what you should be thinking, there's probably not, not a huge amount um, to do at this stage uh, on, on this one, but I would encourage everybody on the call to, when the, when the white paper comes out, um, see there's, there's a bit of a, there's a slight hangover from, from timings on this slide on the right hand side, where we talk about before the end of the year, I, I really do hope the white paper is before the end of this year rather than the, the end of last year. Um, but when that does come out, how are you going to engage with that and how are you going to respond? Um, I, I do encourage you know, as many people as possible to, to get engaged in the process and respond. If we can move on, please. Um, so in, implementation uh, readiness. So I think that the time scale um, will obviously be set at the, out, at, at the outset. Um, our view is that smaller companies will need more time um, and should be given more time to comply uh, with larger listed businesses expected to move first but over time um, we do believe that any entity adopting the UK corporate governance code should be covered um, and if voluntary adoption well if, if anybody wants to voluntary adopt it they, they should be allowed to do so um, now thinking of, of a couple of other things that, that John Thompson said when he was in our academy pre-Christmas, he, he was asked a question, well, do you think a controls regime or the introduction of a controls regime will encourage businesses to delist in the UK to avoid a potentially expensive compliance obligation? Um, and his, his view was over time, he anticipates that there will be a levelling up rather than a levelling down with regards to UK SOX, i.e. this would then be expanded to companies that aren't either FTSE 350 or, or main market listed. So we, we do anticipate it starting there, but, but moving, moving on and, and capturing a greater number of companies. Um, that's in the timeline is, is really, really important. Um, a, a very short timeline would be more disruptive, more costly. It's, it's also likely to 
about a, a large number of deficiencies. Um, certainly, if we were to benchmark, for example, against the standards we see for, for US companies. And it's, it's important for companies to have enough time to, um, to do this properly, but also we don't want them to be throwing out a huge number of deficiencies, which starts to undermine some of the confidence in, in the market as well. So op opportunity to take some time to work through that, fix those when issues are identified before um, public attestation. Now, in terms of what, what corporates should be thinking about here, um, looking at skills and resources that they possess internally to implement those new requirements. If I, if I look at the, the UK market, I think it is important to take a longer term view of that, but I mean, there's, there's not a huge amount of people with um, a really developed skill set in this area. Most of it does tend to come from those which are US listed and, and reside in the UK, but if we're going to expand from 50 or 60 businesses to you know, 350 plus, I do think it's really important to start looking early at the skills and resources that you have in house to make sure that you can make this a success. Um, I'd also consider and, and, or, and urge you to, to look at your IT systems um, and make sure that they are up to scratch. Is there anything that worries you? Um, are you capturing all of them? Um, and also start to, to engage with, with directors in the business to understand well, when do you think you would be able to comply? If, if this was introduced tomorrow, how long would it take for you to get ready? And it's probably a good time um, now, Michael, just to take a pause and I suppose ask the audience. Um, we have a poll question now on the next slide. Um, so how would you describe your readiness for an internal controls um, attestation requirement? So I believe there should be some options there coming up for you. We'll just give you a couple more seconds to vote. Are we ready to look at the results? Yeah, so I think that I think that's quite interesting there. Um, that you know, near forty percent of the respondents said that the controls are in place, but um, you know, re require formalisation. How do you think that compares, Michael, to to UK responses? I think it's pretty consistent. If I look at they're, they're in place and require formalisation, and that the, they're not sure. Um, it's broadly fifty fifty, I suppose, then between those and those that are formalized but maybe not tested and those that are ready so that's that's pretty pretty consistent um possibly there, there were more you know when we did a similar poll in, in the uk webinar who, who thought they had a lot more to do um but, but broadly consistent okay yeah and i think it'll be interesting just in relation to the profile of the ready may okay already have us socks yeah. Okay, can we move on, please? Um, so, stakeholder demand led assurance. So, you know, we have a view that the level of assurance that is required within each corporate should be driven by uh, and in line with an audit and assurance policy. So, it is, it's one of Bryden's recommendations that, that boards should have an audit and assurance policy which should be put to an annual vote by by shareholders and i think what where, where we do disagree slightly with with brian is that we we don't think you know, that assurance should be provided only when only in the event of a control failure or significant failure and you know, we think it is something that should that should come annually um, that said we're not advocating this being external audit or even external audit um, sorry, an external set of assurance. It would be up to up, up to the, I suppose the the board to define in their audit and assurance uh, policy what level of assurance is required, and that can be aligned to very much aligned to the risk. So for the high risk items, 
would you prefer some external insurance for, for those more in the middle you know could could a second line or possibly a third line support with that and for those which are lower risk well actually could could you rely on self-assessment for, for example but but we do think that that assessment process that assurance process should be performed annually in line with the audit and assurance policy to support the, the director's attestation in this um, we think this is important because that, obviously those things are just not going to happen overnight or happen easily it's it's really important to engage with a, a broad group of stakeholders um, to understand what their expectations are um, and to ensure that you, you you get the right answer for for the company so in terms of things to to think about right now um, I already mentioned you know, consider this um, alongside the risk assessment as well and, and you want the profile to be the same or you know, profiles with higher risk higher assurance um, but what should you be thinking about and doing now so I think it's important to engage with various stakeholders across the business to understand what their expectations are um, what you know, understand what they would like to see within our attestation um, challenge whether or not you should have an audit and assurance policy at the moment so we, we, we certainly don't see many of those but we are starting to see some um, so there is there is definitely um, a move in that direction, um, but then also I was thinking again about the risk assessment. Can you can you clearly articulate what the or can the directors clearly articulate what risks are created by the business model and changes in the business model and actually what, if there are changes, what type of assurance or what level of assurance would be helpful to support the risk assessment in that regard. So we have we, another. Oh, sorry, go on, Michael. No, go on. You, I'm just going to introduce the question, but I think over to you then. Okay. Yeah. So we just have another poll question for you now, and um, that's around kind of what what type of assurance do you think would be required for an effective regime? So, would you rely on on a self assessment? So primarily a management assertion for um for assurance over the internal controls would you look to um second or third line um for example internal audit testing um or would you would you like to see external or external audit, audit testing or indeed would it be a combination of those Just give you a few more seconds to to vote. Great. Yeah, I I personally don't think that's surprising that it would be a combination of of one, two, and three. I think to to really a, a draw, uh, drive good um, assurance over over the processes, it would be a combination of of um i suppose you know a management representation um subject to uh, you know second or third line testing and, and then maybe uh, enhanced with her with uh, external audit testing yeah. uh, i think one in when we asked that question to the uk audience we, we had a i suppose that the response was very strong on on external audit and internal audit um, we asked it in a slightly different way. We had a word cloud um, rather than a, than, a, than a poll, but it was internal audit and external audit that, that came through very clearly, suggesting a, a combination as well. I think one thing that, that we are really keen to caution on um, as this comes in over the next few years is what is the role of internal audit? And for a number of UK corporates that we do work with, whilst they may do some testing of controls and financial controls, if they were to spend much more of their time devoted to testing financial controls it would probably be a big step back for them and could also you know, hurt um, or, or hinder some of the risk that some of the assurance that's obtained over other risk domains as well so certainly really important to consider the balance um, so perhaps the answer there is internal audit to internal audit what a second line function is doing by way of assurance as well but it, it will vary no doubt from company to company yeah Okay, um, 
so we thought it would be useful just to give you with a, a provide you with a little, little bit of a flavor of what other UK businesses are doing right now and, and, and Colin mentioned up front well where is the maybe there's some no regret spend so things that could be done now which which are a, a good idea in any way and whatever the UK regime ends up looking like are going to be helpful so I think I'll run through those these on the left hand side re reasonably quickly but the you know, some scoping understanding we think it really what Linda was saying about the UK corporate governance code as it stands it's really important to understand where your risks are and what controls you have in place now so doing some scoping or revisiting the scoping that you have to make sure that is fit for now and fit for the future is certainly a, a very very good idea and it, it can take a bit of time so we'll probably serve as a real time saver when we do get more clarity over what the that the UK controls regime is going to look like. Um, I think it's also really important if, if I'm thinking about the, the implementation readiness once again to start forming a view of what your operational and governance structure within an organisation would, would look like. So if think about the audit insurance policy, one of the things that, that we recommend is included in that is a consideration of how you obtain assurance across the three lines of defence. So who will be doing what, who we, you know, where are those reporting lines going to be, and how is it overall going to be governed? Um, so I think giving some, giving some consideration to what future operating models will look like, again, will, will be an important accelerator if, if done now, but will also provide the directors and, and non-executive directors with um, greater level of assurance that this is right for the business as, as it evolves and, and, and is adopted. And the third one on here is, is is a really interesting one. And if I think about what a lot of my team in, in the UK is, is devoted to at the moment, it is supporting uh, other large programmes that businesses are, are adopting. So if I think about um, finance transformations and, and large scale ERP implementations, there's, there's certainly a, a big demand at the moment for risk and controls to be a key pillar of all of those programs. Um, and I think a lot of that is driven by a, a greater awareness of what is coming and, and there's a need to do more and demonstrate that more is being done. But I also think there's a, a relatively straightforward economic argument to it that if, if this is embedded into those programs throughout, it's gonna be less of a step up towards the end when we do get more clarity over over what this looks like so i think rather than rather than paying twice spending a little bit more now to get it right from 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 the office is the approach that is being adopted um, and then finally i think it's again if I, if I compare what many of my us clients um look like at the moment or you know, look like five years ago certainly their businesses were starting to digitize and starting to move forward and their operating models were developing but risk and control, particularly financial control, hadn't really moved with it. And it was still very manual, maybe some basic technology used, but not that much. I think as part of considering the, the operating model going forward and the governance structure over it, really important to, to consider what technology supports you may want to use that, you may want to use to help deliver that and then to help run it as you go forward as, as well. Um, and I think in terms of Take, taking a medium term view of, over these programs, having the right technology in place early, it, I think that the payback period for that technology is likely to be relatively short as well. I think I'm handing back to, to Colin for... Yeah, you're, you're handing back to me, Michael, and, and thank you, Linda. The, um, and thank you for people who are putting questions on the, on the question box. So just a question for, for, the, for the two of you. Uh, and I think, Michael, you alluded to it earlier, but maybe just, and again, all of these questions are subject to the white paper and the implementation of uh, what follows on from the white paper. But uh, so answering as best we can based on the knowledge we have from reporting and from our stakeholder engagements. Uh, do the requirements apply to listed companies only or they extend to large private companies only or, or extend to large private companies? Michael, so at, yeah, so at, at, at the moment, we think it's going to be private companies, uh, sorry, public companies that will go first, um, likely to be the FTSE 350. Um, but, but over time, we do think that will then 
develop more and and some larger private companies particularly pub, you know, larger private public interest companies um will, will likely have to comply okay thank you in terms of uh, another question there is there a view on how much change for those who are already subject to us SOX, as we now call it uh and those who will be headquartered in the uk and ireland so the the steer we've, we've had is that if a business is doing us SOX there shouldn't be an expectation that they have to do any more to comply with a UK SOX regime. Okay, so we're saying that that's really, it's it's nothing beyond US SOX, is our view. Uh, that, that's our view at the moment, we don't, certainly don't expect it to yeah. be. Yeah, 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 excellent, thank you. Any views in relation to what the, the, the criminal or civil penalties, uh, what they may be? Um, no, not 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 yet. I'm I'm. I think it was possibly mentioned in the FT article that there, there may be something in the, in the white paper on that. Um, certainly in terms of uh, questions being asked, but we we don't have any any views on on that at the moment. Obviously, we do know in the US they they are quite significant. Um, I think up to twenty years in prison and a five million dollar fine. So who knows if we'll we'll follow suit or or go in a similar vein or if we'll we'll do something different. Hope, hopefully we'll we'll get a better idea as Linda was saying over the next few weeks. Okay, that can be it. Um, thank you. Uh, and the common pitfalls, challenges in implementing this that, that we've learned from SOX, just a view in relation to that. I can take take this one if you like. Um, I mean, for me, there, there's probably two two main challenges or pitfalls, and I think the first is around, you know, kind of a cultural awareness and embeddedness of SOX in your in your overall um, governance structure and decision making processes. So I think that when companies are looking at change projects, they forget to include SOX early on in the process, and I, I think it's very very good really that um michael you were saying that some of your clients in the uk that are embarking on transformational transformation projects are including um kind of you know risk and control considerations early on and I, like what i've seen from from my involvement on some SOX projects is that SOX can be left um as kind of a last last check on the project implementation rather than bringing internal control and and risk management specialists in early on so that when you're actually plotting out your, your change processes you're considering what the control uh, internal control and um risk objectives are from the very outset and um, so you know i would definitely think that um a, a cultural and an educational program as you embark on your SOX journey would be a, a useful investment of time so that people are aware of any kind of risk and control considerations they need to embed into key decisions and then the, the second um you know the second consideration is maybe um not when you're looking at technology not considering um what the implication of so the implications of SOX are on your technology. So again, as Michael was mentioning in his in his parts of the presentation, um, making sure that your your IT controls confirm co conform to SOX requirements. And I think that there can be an over reliance on the IT vendors to make sure that the those that the IT general controls are in place, but there are also a lot of kind of internal controls that you need to embed to support um, the SOX compliance of, of your IT control. Excellent, thank you. That's Unless there's any other questions coming up, which I don't see. Oh, great, thank you. So just in terms of, and thank you to our speakers, just in terms of, of closing messages, and I think this is something that when any new uh, program needs to be reviewed, one should take stock of, um, it, it is really kind of act now and start to circulate this with directors and with management in your organizations. Uh, review the, your compliance with the UK Corporate Governance Code, as it's called, uh, and in, indeed looking at the, the Irish Director's Compliance Statement. Have you got a good view of what your internal control environment is? And looking at the bottom bullet, have you got the right people, tools and technology in place to have a, a good perspective in relation to that? I think that's irrespective of what's going to come from this regime. So with that, um, thank you very much for joining us. The session has been recorded. So what we will do is we will send you a link to that. 
And if you'd like to share that with any um, friends or colleagues, feel, feel free to do so. And we will write to you uh, when the white paper comes out and we'll be back to you in relation to this topic. So have a great day and stay safe and see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.